tell me when you get sound with Good evening everyone, uh, hi there, um, hi to everyone here and hi to everyone online. We are, I think, broadcasting now across the globe. Uh, so welcome to this uh, Data Science and Technology Meetup in Edinburgh. My name is Brian Hills, I'm the Head of Data at the Data Lab, um, and tonight I'm going to introduce the two speakers that we have. Um, a couple of things uh, from Data Lab side uh, to just give you an update on before we start. Um, so many of you know we're doing a lot of stuff in education just now. Um, and we um, have launched an NGD with St Andrews and um, we've filled that with companies sponsoring. We're now looking for research engineers uh, to join that. So we've got two spare places left. If anybody wants to look at research engineers, uh, research engineering in our NGD, let us know afterwards. Um, and we've also launched the uh, boot camp with the Data Incubator from New York coming across in September. So they'll be doing three weeks of uh, introduction to data science, machine learning and visualization. So there's various options if anybody's interested in that, gives a shout afterwards um, as well. So that's enough from the Data Lab uh, um, side. Um, just moving on then to our first speaker. So our first speaker is Hugh Bruscardine from TV Squared. Uh, Hugh and I have a little bit of history. Um, I used to work with Hugh many years ago in Sumerian. Uh, he taught me I'm going to see all I know about analytics. <laughs> I won't say so more be than lying, that. Yep. <laughs> um, and he's going to give us uh, an insight to what they're doing at TV Squared and broadly talking about when big data gets huge. So he'll talk about that. We'll do some questions after that and then we'll move on to our next speaker, Zach, from the uh, DMA. Hugh. Thank you, Brian. Uh, so uh, very quickly, just a bit of introduction. Um, so I'm one of the co-founders of TV Squared. Uh, we're about four years old as a company. Um, I wrote the original algorithm. Um, it's a classic case. Brian will know my um, back. So we've moved on a little bit since then. Um, uh, and, but that just gives you a little bit of the background. So what am I going to talk about tonight? Um, firstly, the problems of scale. Um, when we founded TV Squared four years ago, it was us with an idea and a possible client. We've grown a bit since then, and we've come across some problems. Um, and I'd like to talk about what we've found, um, and crucially, how we've solved some of those problems, and particularly some of the opportunities that arise uh, as a result of growing, and some of the good things that can come from that. And then finally, just to wrap that up, talk a little bit about, about the human factor and, and, uh, and what we can learn from that. Um, but I will have to very quickly just give you a bit of a background to what we're doing, and I will do this in just one slide. Um, so essentially what we do is measure the effectiveness of TV advertising. TV adverts run, what does it do for your business? And what we do is measure the effectiveness of that so that you can then change your buy. So let me give you an example. Let's say that you're running this particular outfit. Um, Roughly, who do you think your target market is? Broadly. Market. Very good. Yeah, so could be. You might have some older customers in there as well. Who could give me an idea of roughly what kind of TV programs they're going to be interested in where you might reach them? Football. Correct. <laughs> but the problem is, if you advertise in the middle of a game, what happens as soon as the advert comes? You're a TV mad young man. Uh, sorry, football mad young, uh, uh, young man, what happens as soon as TV adverts come on? You go and get beer, you go to the loo. So the problem you've got there is that the places where you're most likely to reach your target audience are often the times when they're least interested in seeing your TV advertising. So there's a real game of cat and mouse to be played about finding where there's a higher proportion of the people you want to talk to but when they're not quite so interested in the, the main TV programming. So it's a quite tricky problem to solve. And that's what we've done. We have actually managed to solve it. And that seems to be a valuable thing, and people like it. 
So um, that gets us onto our problems of scale. Um, four years ago, we were, as I say, two or three guys in a kitchen. Um, we're now operating in about 47 countries. And we start to see some pretty big problems arising. Um, this chap, of course, has something to, interesting to say on that one. Um, compound interest. It's one of the most powerful forces in the, in the universe. Uh, I'm going to throw up a chart to give you an idea of that. This is just a, a, a particular, we, we draw charts like this absolutely all the time. This particular statistic is the number of file loads that we get of a particular type of data um, going over, um, actually I probably could update that, it's still going that direction. But broadly went from about sort of 20 a month up to 1,000 a month. And when we put that, that's a tight R squared, 91%. But that's looking at 3.8 times annual growth, about 0.4% every single day. And the load on our service has been doing that as well. So down here at the 20 end, well, I do have a laser pointer, we are doing about 10,000 records a day, something like that. We're now up to about 200 million a day. And that causes problems. Any kind of architecture, you'll start to see problems. Um, but the other thing that will is that System takes about an hour to process it, and we'll send you an email when it's done. Okay. Now, normally, or prior to our service, this was taking six weeks or so. So the idea that we could do this in an hour was absolutely fantastic, and it's one of the reasons that we've been reasonably successful. What was actually happening was this. You submit your data, and we have to stop what we're doing, then do a file reformat with whatever garbage the client has sent us, calculate, republish, and you get a, email, get a mail. But that thing is not going to scale. Okay? Um, and it's just the sort of an example of the sort of problems that you come across. And in fact, like all these things, like any technology thing, it's not just about technology. It's that lovely combination of people, process, and technology. So let me just talk a little bit about the technology side. Um, schemas break as well. And they break in really peculiar ways. So here's an example of the kind of thing that we will get. We get a couple of hundred million of these every day. Um, and it's a, it's, a, it's a request for a particular web service. Um, and what we've got here is we've got an object ID for that particular, that particular session record, and that's going to be a unique key. So that's fairly obvious. That can go on the, on the main fact table. Um, this is a cookie ID for that particular visitor. We don't know who it is, but we know it is him or her. Um, now, what we'd really like to be able to do I'm going to ask you to do some third normal form uh, in, in a moment, um, is to see where visitors come back again. So that's a 24-byte cookie ID, um, and that's a bit long to, store, long to store on the fact table. But come on, how many people are out there in the world? The 7 billion, you're unlikely to get more than 2 billion of them across your website. That means you can store it in a 4-byte four four integer field. Done. Marvellous. Uh, Timestamp, that's going to resolve. We've got lots of other uh, interesting payload data that will we'll normalize beautifully, and the IP address is four bytes anyway. So, but the real key here is this visitor. So you're already thinking, I can see the SQL schemas on, on number of faces already, and it looks something like that, that you take the visitor cookie ID off into a separate leaf table, um, and you store the visitor ID, you get a four byte, four byte key, and you're done. Except you're not. This tends to break, and it breaks in a really peculiar way. So, over time, we get all this session data, and every day we get a new patch of it, and it gets stuck in the bottom of the table, and we're away, and that's all nice. The visitors, there are not quite as many of those records, but the problem is they don't add neatly like that. They add like this, at which point everything breaks, because your index and storage gets tremendously fragmented, um, and, and essentially, when you're trying to put all these records together and put them into the tables, most of the time is trying to sort out that table. And it's just a waste of much time. And you've actually, unless you've got m hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of repeat visitors who are doing hundreds of sessions, you actually, store, you actually save very, very little. So what looks like a sensible schema when you're doing 10,000 records a day or a million records a day stops working. And by that stage, you've got a large business with lots of people who like what you do, and it's all falling apart around your ears. So that's no good. Um, and then, of course, we get on to lots of other interesting problems that you get with, with process and, uh, and scale. So um, 
colored in is the areas where we are operating. Um, US time zones. TV advertising is, is incredibly time dependent. And you can air an advert, it'll go out on the East Coast, and then three hours later it'll go again in Pacific. And you've got to be able to parse that, parse that data and know who could have been responding to which, which advert. So all of a sudden, as you scale out across geographies, you see all sorts of different problems. Same with languages. Uh, in India, of course, you've got um, 100 different languages, and TV advertising will be par um, uh, partitioned by, uh, by the language that's going out there. And you can use that as a key to help, help with the key. Uh, we had an interesting one in, in South Korea where they wanted to upload um, data in South Korean, obviously. Um, and of course, that's great, and we had built it. We, we, that's the one where we had thought ahead, so we can handle the Unicode characters, but we can't read it. <laughs> so the system worked, and they were happy with it, but we couldn't support it. But over the top of this, you then suddenly start to have this round-the-clock support requirement. And that turns into not just a process problem, but a, but a real people problem as well. How do you actually scale that out? Um, and actually what we found is that um, Asia Pack, particularly if you're doing leading edge stuff, people will be quite, um, uh, what's the word? Uh, they'll be quite accommodating uh, to see, uh, you know, overlapping times where you can do that. Um, so, but you also get this back to this problem as well. When I picked up that disc, and I did get it back into the office for Friday night to brick bats from the rest of the team, because that meant they lost their weekend. Um, it had a file on it from their German mainframe, comma separated file with a comma decimal separator. And that's also the kind of problem that you find. Every time you go into a new country, you get different, uh, different data standards, you get different data formats. Um, don't talk to me about date formats in particular. The Americans have got a lot to answer for on that, uh, on that, on that side. So um, all in all, all of those things start to hurt as you grow. Um, but it isn't all bad. Um, and in fact, it isn't all bad across our friend, across all of these dimensions as well. Um, that there are solutions and there are opportunities across people, process, and technology. Uh, I'm going to talk very quickly about the, uh, about the technology side, because I'm also aware of our timing here. Um, Amazon. We all love Amazon. Um, again, going back to some time ago, we had to hire two to three really expensive guys to do our load balancing. That's just done out of the box now. The combination of CloudWatch and auto-scaling, again, gives you the most astonishing ability to scale and do that incredibly cheaply. The sort of kit that really was only available to enterprise outfits 10 years ago, you can do as two people in a kitchen. The key to this, however, is how you separate data. And so RDS will do a good job of making sure that it's all stored and it's all resilient and redundant. The trick is to make sure that everything that's not on the database layer is completely expendable. It's all just ephemeral. So you can just shoot servers and they will reboot and they just come back up and the queue will rerun. And armed with that, if you know that that's how you are going to architect, it means that you can build and scale incredibly, incredibly fast. We now do spend an awful lot of money with Amazon, and we're spending a lot more following the change in the exchange rate because they do price in dollars. Um, um, but it does, it does give you enormous flexibility. And I've had to deal in the past with um, uh, enterprise capacity management, where you are still looking at physical boxes in racks. And, and it's been a breath of fresh air doing it with Amazon. Um, MongoDB, um, three things about Mongo. It is really, really stupid in comparison to a lot of uh, other database technologies, and particularly my background is mostly SQL, um, but it's really fast, really, really fast. So our couple hundred million records a day go straight into Mongo, and we're only just beginning to find its limits now. Um, we have, we're, we're not, unfortunately, we're not able to shard in the same way that um, uh, Mongo would like you to do. Um, so we are having to put those 100 million records through a single collection, which is where um, it, is, it is a bit of a problem. Um, but in terms of, again, um, building your applications, the fact that it's storing documents that are just native 
to JavaScript and Python means that you go straight between the database layer and the application layer without having to, to, to do enormous amounts of manipulation. And it makes that the, the thinking of what you're doing very, very much simpler. Um, and of course, the redundancy resiliency straight out of the box. This is brilliant for us. From a release process, it's fantastic. Essentially what that means, who uses Mongo, by the way? Show of hands for Mongo. <gasps> Just one. They have a concept of, um, essentially it clusters out of the box. And they vote, you have a, a, a cluster of servers that will, um, that will vote on who's the primary, on which node is the primary. Which means essentially if you need to, 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 to do a release, if you need to do an update to one of those boxes, you build your template, kill one of the secondaries and reboot it, wait for it to sync up, and then you just cycle through. And when you kill the primary, it takes around about half a second, maybe less than that, but it will just rebuild and it'll say, okay, that one's gone, and it just it changes and will give you a new primary immediately. So you can do releases with almost no downtime. And for us, that's absolutely essential. We have to, we have to be live all the time. So process. Um, who likes the XKCD? Yeah, there's one or two. If you haven't seen it, that's your, that's your web address down there. Um, Marvellous cartoons. The more you do something, the more data you can collect about it, and the more you can see where you can make improvements. So what this chart tells you is, if you're doing a task daily or weekly, and you could potentially automate it to take 30 minutes off it, it's worth spending five days to do that automation. Now, if you remember the numbers on the chart earlier, um, we were doing something around about daily, and we're now up to well beyond 50 a day, at which point it starts to become worthwhile to take 30 minutes out of that process. But there is a general learning here that the more that you can store data about what you are doing, the more data you've got to tell you where you should be looking for improvement. And this chart tells you whether or not it's worth doing it. But to put that in context, let me just uh, go back to, to this one here. Essentially, our problem was this. These green ones here were already pretty much automated. They were pretty much a button click. That was the problem. So there was a lot of client education that needed to be done. But we already had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of example files, at which point you've then got the data to be able to noodle through and work out, well, what are the similarities? What are the mappings that people have to do? What are the formats that we need to be able to accept? And as soon as you've done that, that gives you a really good design case for, for, for how to do that automation. So there we go. In fact, you'll see it's grey here. It's not actually possible to save 30 minutes more than 50 times a day because that is more than a day's worth. Um, and that is, in fact, fairly quickly where we got to. You have to do that automation because otherwise you fall over. Um, but there's lots of other interesting that you can do when you have got more data. Um, you'll notice that this thing here is called predict. Um, so uh, who knows who this guy is? Yes, we've got one at the back. It is indeed Niels Bohr. And he said something very interesting. Prediction is very difficult, especially about the future. Um, so we have this product here, which uh, we're just bringing to market at the moment, which is can we see, can we tell you automatically what you should be doing? So rather than just presenting the results about what's working, actually noodle through and distill those into a set of recommendations. But the trick here is to understand, well, does this, does this prediction algorithm actually work? And you need a lot of client data to be able to do that. But again, as soon as you start to, to sit on top of more clients, you get to the chance to be able to actually analyze your own data and to play with your own algorithms. Um, and indeed, lots more data. This is a great one. Um, as soon as you start to see, again, lots and lots of customers for, say, a particular industry sector, you can start to say, well, how do they behave? So the color coding here is the, the relative performance by time of day and day of week. And when you group together all of our customers for a particular, uh, for a particular industry sector, and I'm not going to tell you which one this is, you find that there actually are, is a very, very strong pattern. Uh, it's not really related by day or week, but the day part's important. But that varies very dramatically from industry to industry. Um, so we can do that kind of cluster analysis to say, well, how do these things go together? What are the important dimensions here? 
Is it about audience? Is it about the industry sector? Is it about the channel? And so forth. And what we find is that whilst this evening time might not be good, where is brilliant changes and you get this different pattern here. But that's really, really valuable data for people coming into this new where they don't really have anything to go on. Well, maybe we can give some guidance on it. And indeed, and your, your data scientists amongst you will notice here, no axes, but we can start to look at spend patterns as well. How does that vary? Do some people go on off? Uh, are there, is there a very tight campaign or is it even over the year? And we can see how that moves. So um, what do we learn from all of this? Um, firstly, um, and this is slightly controversial, we're not normal. Um, I was talking to Zach earlier and he's saying it's just wonderful to be in Edinburgh. And he's right. This is one of the greatest capital cities in the world. Wimbledon is on. The football is on. And you guys are sitting here in a dark room listening to me speak. That is not normal behavior. Okay. <laughs> so the thing that I, I you notice that does say we. I'm, I'm including myself in this. Um, but it, it isn't normal. And data scientists are not normal people. And the key thing to learn from this is you've got to leave your own prejudices or indeed your own preconceptions, I should say, at the door. You should let the data speak for itself because it's very important not to, in, not to go in with an idea about, well, this is how I do things because we're not normal. A corollary to that is show early results early. We are very often the one-eyed man in the, king of the blind, in the kingdom of the blind. And it's astonishing. I'm always, I'm continually astonished at how our customers are really blind. They have no data at all and they have no good quality information about what they should be doing. So as soon as you can get anything that looks like an interesting result, get it out there and show it to people because it may be that that's enough for them to work with and you can go off and move and go and do something else more interesting rather than going down into the nth degree of detail on that. And finally, and corollary to that, is the really, really interesting bit is to help where there is no data. Because that's the bit that people are most at sea with. It's the bits that you've not seen, that you've not done, that you've not tested. That's the really interesting stuff. And anywhere where you can infer from your results or expand out from your results, that's the stuff that's absolutely gold dust. So that's a little bit about our story. Um, and I think I've managed to come in exactly on my half an hour. I was nervous I was going to overrun. Um, Good time for questions. Have we got any? time for questions? Yeah. So um, we did in the first instance try to put in here is a standard and this is what we would like to see um, just so that we could get something built. Um, but, it's, but it's quite tricky to do that and it's quite tricky to do that across a large number of customers where they're going to have to do manual work. So essentially the approach there was to see, okay, we know what we're looking for and we know what our fields need to be. And we could build dictionaries or kind of libraries of the terms that we had seen so that essentially when someone sent in a file, two things happened. Thing number one is you discard and you search for anything that looks like the header record. So there's a first piece of intelligence, which is to throw away all the extraneous rows and columns around what looks like a block of data. Okay, so that's the first task. And you can use the dictionaries to do that, to say, OK, I've got lots of things in a block, and I can understand some of these, so this is a pretty good clue that it's, it's that. And we will always get the extra sheets in a workbook or something that need to be thrown away. And the next thing is then to, say, is to, to, to use those dictionaries to be able to say, this is our best guess at the mapping, and to be able to do as much mapping as you can do, and then present them with a screen that says, we haven't identified these fields, and here are some important things that we do need that you haven't given us. Drag and drop, save that mapping, you're done. And the next time they, that client sends up that file, it just goes straight through with no, um, uh, with no manual intervention at all. 
So it's a combination of those things. It's about the, the two parts. Find the block of data and then get the, the, the libraries, the dictionaries of what the aliases are for particular terms. Yes? I'm just wondering, have you taken strides, or are you, um, doing this without human intervention? I mean, from the client's point of view, so that TV advertising would become programmatically, automatically bought as online advertising? Um, it's, it's so exciting, and it will happen. Um, the, the TV industry is a l long way behind. There is some of this which is beginning to happen. So you see remnant inventory is traded in um, through some platforms in the US. Um, there are some legislative hurdles, so it can be tricky to, you need to keep uh, similar products into different ad breaks, for example. There can be legislation around that. That varies from country to country. Um, the second thing is, of course, there can be restrictions on what you can advertise where. Um, but yes, that's where it's going. The, the key to that, though, is in order to be able to trade programmatically, you need to be able to value a spot. So you need to have a, a market in which an auction can happen. And in order to do that, everybody needs to have their view of what the value is. And that's what we're trying to do. But, it, but yes. Know, it's, it's not the clients, the buyers' problem, it's the TV station's problem. It's everybody's and they, problem. And they, should be working with you to sell the joint service to the client. Um, it's, you can put it, your ads in the best place. Um, yes and no. Um, they will. It's, it is exactly the same. You have exactly the same, you know, publisher and, and, and buyer market. That essentially they will have a view of what the uh, of what a, a, a floor price will be. Different buyers will have different views on that price. Um, but it, it's exactly the same. It will get there. It's going to take a little bit of time. But yes. A key to that is making sure that, that the values exist um, and so people can actually value the spots. Do we have any questions online, guys? Okay. Any further questions here? One more back. Uh, it's, it's not so much a data question, it's about a, a people question. Um, your company is scaled from two people in the kitchen to how many people you are now. Mm -hmm. You're doing this while you're still trying to serve the customer, being yeah. reactive to the customer. Our company's gone through a very similar growth journey. Culturally, we found it hard. Collaboration-wise, we found it very hard to share information amongst each other. How have you addressed the collaboration side of, of getting people talking to each other and, and not relying on you know, the telephone all the time? Um, there's still an awful lot of Skype <laughs> and WhatsApp and Google Hangouts. Um, we're quite stretched, so we have quite a lot of our um, sales teams. We've got pre-sales in the US as well, um, and, that, and that is a problem. Um, you get used to it. We've always been built as a company with people working remotely. And so as a, as a company, we have tried to stretch that. There is, from a dev perspective, however, um, a lot to be said for being able to just get around a whiteboard. And I think that's, that still remains a really crucial human collaboration problem about how to do that very large scale um, or that, the very sort of the big hand small map whiteboard sessions, um, those we do still do in one room, and we'll get you know a webcam. So we've got a product manager in, in New York, for example, who will be watching that, um, doing that. But it, it is, it's it, it's it's that remains tough. That does remain tough. I was hoping you had a. No, I'm afraid no. There's <laughs> new product. <laughs> Can I ask the last one here? So, Go on, Brian. So, so we get a lot of people coming to us with new products that are digital, and then they realize actually they're creating data products. And yep. they go, crikey, uh, what architecture should I use? Where do I start? Did you guys go through a decision process to get to AWS, or did you just think, I'm going to Bezos? Um, we went to Bezos. Yeah. Yeah, uh, we went we went, we went, to Bezos. But interestingly, that the, the, when you start with Bezos, He's, he's got a great model there um, because we, I, I originally wrote the, the first algorithm um, in Microsoft SQL because, again, it was just the quickest way I could get that particular functionality in. And we did have to pay a, a Microsoft tax for that. So I think it was about seven cents an hour for a, for a um, uh, for Microsoft Box through AWS rather than the Linux, which is commodity Linux, which is one cent an hour. 
they get you in when, when you're still small. Um, and there is a lot that you can do with just a very, very small instance, and then you grow from there. But it gives us that ability to scale and stretch and get all of the background um, you know, stuff to make it into a proper enterprise architecture with all the backup and redundancy and DR sites and all the things that are much, 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 much harder to do if you're doing it in your, inside, your own, um, inside your own architecture. Um, we've been trialing a whole st stack of different database products, and so the concept of having Mongo as the uh, as the main database product um, that we've been using, we've been trial various. We've been trialing various NoSQL uh, products. React was one of the other ones that we looked at, uh, and we found that actually Mongo was the the one that worked best for us. Okay. Okay. So I can jump in just for one last question. Just interested in how you classify your competitors. We work with a lot of the sort of like media agencies and ones in like the WTP group, Omnicom, yep. and things like that. Yep. They're now expanding more into doing more data science type work and looking for your PhD type guys. Are they, are they your traditional competitors or would you say you've not got any national sort of competitors? Um, that's, uh, that's very interesting. What, what, what tends to happen with the big network agencies is that, um, yes, they are running data science teams. Um, unfortunately, they have some conflicts of interest with how they sell the media to their clients. Um, and what we, what we tend to find is that we will work with the agencies um, and, and many of the agencies that we work with see us as a point of difference and it's something that they don't have to do. Um, but also we provide independence to the clients as well. So we're, we're essentially we're, we're giving, our uh, giving our clients an independent view of, uh, of, of how, the, uh, how the media is working. Um, but there are, there are other products out there. Um, we're very fast to market. We're very, very, very fast to get set up. Um, so we're fairly confident that we're we're ahead of the game in in, in, in that re in that regard. Okay, thanks very much, Hugh. Thank you. Thank you. Straight into it. So second up tonight um, is uh, Zach Thornton from the DMA. Zach. All right. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, my name's Zach Thornton. I'm an external affairs manager at the DMA. Um, DMA are the uh, Direct Marketing Association. Does anyone know by show of hands who the DMA are in this room? Oh, we've got a few people. Um, so the Direct Marketing Association, for the rest of you that don't know, we uh, represent one-to-one -one marketing in the UK. So we have a membership big brands, banks, suppliers, all the way down to email platforms and various other services. So we cover the whole breadth of one-to-one -one marketing. And I would say that, in a sense, we, rep we uh, represent the data-driven marketing as opposed to strictly one-to-one. -one. And uh, today I wanted to talk about the general data protection regulation. Has anyone heard of it? I would say a few. So Brussels has created this new piece of legislation. It's taken six years to get here. We finally got it, and now we have Brexit, but that's another issue. Um, <laughs> so it is harmonising quite divergent laws across Europe. So if you're a business operating across Europe, the different data protection regimes from the UK to France to Germany are all quite different. So this law is going to bring us into line, and all Europeans will have one piece of legislation to deal with. And I've spent much of my time over the last two years lobbying, both in the UK and in Brussels, to try and achieve a regulation that strikes that right balance between the interests of business on the one hand and then our rights as consumers. So it, it, all, starts in, uh, it all starts in Brussels. But before we uh, talk about the regulation itself, considering what happened uh, last week with Brexit, I thought I'd talk a little bit first about British politics and what it means for us. So I've got a picture there of British politics at the moment. Um, <laughs> we have a very strange situation. We had Prime Minister question times of the day with a Prime Minister who's leaving and an opposition one who's facing a vote of no confidence. So we really are in, a, in strange times. But what does Brexit mean? Does Brexit mean that the UK can forget all that nasty European legislation and do our own thing now and not have to bother? Well, no, it's not, it's not quite that simple. So will Brexit change anything? And I think the short answer to that question is no, because uh, 
wherever we are, outside of Europe, inside Europe, we're going to need some sort of trading relationship with the EU and we'd have to offer protections to European citizens' data. So we couldn't leave and suddenly do away with the data protection regulation and slash all of our protections for citizens' data because then we wouldn't be able to trade with Europe and that's not what we want. And of course, if you are a business uh, processing European citizens' data, then you have to abide by the general data protection regulation anyway as it applies to any processing of European citizens' data. So the UK and our regulator, the Information Commissioner's Office, will move forward. It won't be called GDPR, but they will create a piece of legislation that offers broadly similar protections to the GDPR. So although it won't be GDPR per se, it will be something very, very similar. Um, I put up there, this is the um, ICO response to uh, what happened with the Brexit. So obviously but there was a lot of worry about laws not being obeyed anymore. And the 1998 Data Protection Act is still there, so that is still the law, the law of the land for marketing in the UK, and that remains there. That doesn't change. The uh, Brexit also doesn't mean a reduced role necessarily for the UK and for the DMA like us for our lobbying efforts in Europe. So as an organisation as the UK, it's even more imperative now that we have our voice heard in Europe. We'll have to use other avenues and the Europeans may pay less attention to our views, but we have to make sure that we're still out there influencing the debate. The UK was uh, instrumental when the regulation was created in being a voice, a more pragmatic and sensible voice that the British are so known for against some of the more uh, strict interpretations that we see on the continent amongst uh, our European partners, the Germans, have much stricter interpretations of uh, the way we should treat personal data. And I will move on now from Brexit, having uh, covered that off. And uh, briefly go, oh, I see I've spent, spelt information wrong there. It's a, a good start. <laughs> um, I suppose to say Information Commissioner. So uh, this is the view of the Information Commissioner, Christopher Graham. He's actually leaving his po post soon. If anyone doesn't know, he's the, the head honcho for data protection in the UK and is responsible for enforcing the law. And the, the, uh, ministers, the minister responsible was a lady called Baroness Neville Rolfe. And this is how they see the data protection regulation. And I think for them, more than anything, it's a powerful driver for change. So although it will, in the short term, be quite disruptive in the marketing world and the way we see and the way we use data, in the long term it will lead us to a situation that consumers actually want. Consumers want more transparency and more control over how the data is used. And that's where the regulation is pushing us, pushing us away from perhaps in the past where marketing companies and agencies have been deliberately obscuring what they do and not being transparent with consumers because they want more data in that pool that's permission for them to use for their marketing. And it's pushing us away from that. Up there is this uh, statement from the uh, Green MEP, Jan Philipps Olbrecht, who is the, uh, the main driver in the European Parliament for the General Data Protection Regulation. So he was pushing, really, for lots of new rights for consumers, the right to, erase, to have your data erased, the right to data portability, so that you can have your data in a clear format from one energy supplier and port it to another to get you the best deal that you can. So his focus really was on boosting those type of rights. Some of the headline proposed changes, these are essentially a whistle stop of what I'll go through tonight of the main changes and how they affect uh, direct marketing. So we have an expanded definition of personal data in there, the number of new rights, as I mentioned, much more onerous sanctions for breaches. So for those companies, organisations that do breach the regulation, the punishments are much more severe than they've ever been before. It's no longer a, a simple slap on the wrist. And who the regulation covers is now being expanded. In the past, it had been data controllers, but that's now being expanded to data processors as well, who will share liability. Now, as the uh, Direct Marketing Association, the bit we're most interested in is consent, because consent is how we get data permissions and how we can market to people. Up there are the uh, two different definitions of consent. Uh, the one there is the current one and then over there is where, where we're moving to. Now there was a, a long debate where the regulation was being thrashed out over the difference between explicit and unambiguous and what those two words mean. The privacy advocates were arguing for uh, explicit consent and we were arguing for unambiguous. 
although if you look in the dictionary, the words mean essentially the same thing. So it's lawyers arguing over nothing, really. But we ended up with the word we wanted, which was unambiguous consent. And the main departure from the past is this bit here, given by either a statement or a clear affirmative action. So consent is only valid if it is given by a clear affirmative action. In the text, they have something called recitals, which give uh, real-world examples which help you flesh out what the regulation actually means. And so when you say clear affirmative action, what they're getting rid of is at the moment you probably sin online, you get a pre-ticked box, and then the way you consent is you click the submit button at the bottom, but you actually haven't noticed the pre-ticked box, and then that's counted as consent. That's the type of thing that will no longer be permissible under the, under the uh, new law. But what it does include is uh, things like choosing your technical settings. So if you went onto your uh, browser and changed your cookie settings, then that would count as a consent to cookies or any clear affirmative action. So the ticking of a box, it has to be a positive in rather than you being misinformed, not noticing or uh, through inactivity. But really, the, um, the major change in terms of consent is the information requirements. So when your personal data is collected by an organisation, the uh, company will have to display much more information at that stage to inform you about what you're actually signing up to. So you, the only way you can be informed as a customer is to fully know what you're actually consenting to. So there's a list of different information requirements up there, about 16 different pieces that you'll have to list. And so it is those I've put up there, the MV, the information requirements is really the game changer in all this. But there is a, another legal basis that you can use to uh, process personal data, consent being one. Uh, the other is legitimate interests. And so the legitimate interest is essentially what you use in an opt-out consent environment. So what's doing about there, an affirmative opt-in, that is you clicking the box and you've consented. Legitimate interest is recognised, the direct marketing, sorry, is recognised as a legitimate interest and to, uh, just up there, cannot use it where fundamental rights and freedoms of the individuals override the rights of the organisation. So the way you get past this is you have a, to satisfy a test and that test is to uh, provide an unsubscribe slash opt out. So when you have the uh, data collection, you offer someone a clear opportunity to not be in the pool of future marketing and if they don't do that, then you're able to contact them on that basis. I mentioned earlier the information requirements that were there. There's uh, 16 different pieces of information in the uh, regulation that you'd have to display at the data collection stage. So these are just a few of them up there. It's going to be quite difficult for new products, new goods, new services. If you're consenting to an app on your phone, on your uh, smartphone, how you actually display all this information without it just being a really long, another hurdy-durdy privacy policy that no one understands. So they have to have to become quite creative copywriters out there to try and make this actually work for people so it does achieve the objective of making consumers more informed and doesn't actually just add another layer of bureaucracy and complexity which confuses people. So moving forward for people like yourselves in, in, involved in marketing. You need to go through and review and see the data you're using right now. Are you relying on legitimate interest or consent for, to uh, send marketing communications to people? A lot of companies right now don't have a clue which one they're actually relying on. And you will need to know under the new regulation which one you're actually using. There's this uh, something called the principle of accountability in there. So you have to do a lot of record keeping to show that you are accountable to the regulator if they ever come knocking at your door and ask, can you demonstrate that Joe Bloggs consented on X date to you to send in this marketing communication? So you're going to have to go back into your, into your legacy data and dig out uh, the justifications for how you, are, how you are contacting those people. I mentioned at the start that uh, the definition of personal data had been uh, expanded greatly. So up there, IP addresses and cookies, things previously not considered personal data will uh, now be considered personal data. So IP addresses, we use an IP address identifies a device and not a person, which had been our argument, but the regulation has expanded that definition to include IP addresses and cookies as well. 
So as marketers, we have to think about how we're going to deal with this extension of the definition of personal data to other forms of data. But moreover, there isn't a hard line yet as to what is non-personal and what is personal data. We need guidance on that from the European regulators and from the UK regulators over to where that line actually sits. So if you had a cookie sitting in the ad okay system where it identifies someone as a 55-year-old man that loves red wine, then that perhaps would not be personal data, but we'd have to see where that interpretation goes. And there are also obviously another number of measures you can use to uh, lower the risk to you as an organisation. So using pseudonymous data, pseudonymizing data, I should say, or anonymous data. Not that helpful in a direct marketing context because you want to know the people, who the people are you're contacting. Um, here's one we've been uh, struggling with at the DMA, this passage, to make sense of. So profiling is something they are, in a sense, I think, cracking down on quite a lot here. But a person has uh, the right to unsubscribe, opt out from a decision based on profiling, which produces legal effects or similarly significant effects. This is one of those things very woolly and vague. We don't actually know what is meant by legal or significant effects, and that's something we'll need guidance from in the future. But in terms of profiling, you'll have to provide much more information about profiling at the data collection stage. So if you intend to profile someone's personal data, you'll have to say for what reasons and why in succinct and clear language. And um, figuring out a way to do that without scaring people is going to be quite difficult because people are, hear about profiling, they think of the CIA and someone smashing through their door in the middle of the night and think of Big Brother. So you have to, to get them to opt in and to sign up to that profiling without scaring them off is going, going to be difficult. And up there as well, people have um, the right to object for profiling for uh, direct marketing purposes at any time. So someone could call up, ask not to be profiled, you'd have to stop that. You would of course have to explain that if they opted out of profiling, it doesn't mean they're not going to get marketing still, they're just going to get irrelevant generic marketing as opposed to marketing that makes sense for them. So this comes back to that transparency. We need to be more open with people and explain to them what the value exchange is and that in return for their data, they do get more relevant and targeted communications, which I'm sure most people would prefer as opposed to stuff that they're not interested in. I'm going to move on now to uh, data breach notification. So there's now, you have to, if an organisation has a data breach, within 72 hours or without undue delay, they have to notify the Information Commissioner's Office. And they have to, the report has to cover those four things there. But this is actually quite difficult to do. Many organisations don't have robust procedures in place to be able to identify these risks. So you had a situation uh, with the CEO of TalkTalk when they had their big data breach last year and the CEO stood up, went on camera, was being swamped by the media and didn't actually, wasn't actually able to say what records had been stolen, what information had been stolen, so it ended up in a PR nightmare. So it's imperative that you get this audit also from a brand perspective but also from the, regula the, regula the regulatory authorities could take action against you if you're not able to notify them of a breach. It's also going to be problematic for the Information Commissioner's Office as they don't have the resources to be able to deal with all these new notifications they'll be receiving from various different companies telling them of the different breaches they've had, because they happen more often than you think. So marketers and marketing agencies should be developing a way they can react to these. What procedures can they put in place to detect and pick up a data breach very quickly and ensure that they can contact the authorities and also, where necessary, inform the customers themselves of what's happened and how you plan to mitigate that risk and restore their privacy. On to the, uh, the next one, um, subject access requests. At the moment, firms can levy a £10 charge for people requesting, requesting their data, or what, what data an organisation holds about them. That fee will be done away with, which does raise the spectre of more vexatious requests from people trying to harm your company as opposed to actually looking to find out information. But on a moral, moral level, you have a right to see and find out what data a company holds, out, holds about you. And also now, in, at the moment, you have to provide a hard copy to a solid access request, even if someone would rather have it over email. And at the, now, in the future regulations, you'll be able to give them an email copy rather than wasting time and money sending them a hard copy. 
One of the new rights I wanted to go over was uh, the rights to erasure. It was um, uh, formerly known as the rights to be forgotten. It was popularised by this, uh, called the Google Spain case. So there was a, a man in Spain and he had a judgment against him some years ago where some of his possessions, I think his house was seized as some, some bad debt. So he, when you typed in his name on Google, what came up was all the news stories related to his house and his uh, possessions being seized. He didn't like this, so he wanted it to be forgotten. So he had a court case to have his uh, information stripped from the internet service provider and from Google so people couldn't find it. Ironically, he's ended up being very popular and well-known across the world. <laughs> <laughs> so I think he's regretting the day he made that decision. Um, but yes, you, have, you do have the right to erasure, so you can ring up an agency, a supplier, a marketing firm, and have your data deleted. But of course, an organisation is allowed to uh, keep your data on there on an in-house suppression file if your reason for having your data being deleted is so you don't receive any more marketing. And this is that um, organisations will have to put in an effort into their contact centres, people on the phone who are interacting with customers and give them the knowledge so they are able to explain to people when they ring up, trying to articulate these new rights, what they actually mean, what the ramifications are. So a matter of training and making sure your people are able to speak about these rights and inform consumers and customers of, you know, if you're asking if your data is to be deleted, but you, what you mean is you don't want marketing, it's explained that they will keep your data on a suppression file, but the reason for that is to not have marketing, for example. You know, I mentioned at the start, the data processes are now covered. They share liability with uh, data controllers, which is a departure from the past. Two concepts that have been introduced under this principle of accountability I was talking about earlier are uh, privacy by design and privacy by default. So this is the notion, privacy by design, that at the start of a marketing campaign, all marketers should be aware of the possible impacts their marketing campaign could have on privacy and then record those and take the appropriate action to mitigate those risks. So it isn't just a fact of bunging off a campaign to the legal and compliance team and then saying yes or no. It's that everyone across the process thinking about these issues and taking them on board. In a similar vein, privacy by default is something companies like Apple will have trouble adhering to that if you have a new product, a new service, it should have its privacy settings set to the maximum level they can be from, from the start as opposed to at a lower level and then someone setting them higher. And also a data protection officer. So if you carry out large scale and systemic monitoring of, indiv of individuals, then you'll have to employ a data protection officer. We, again, we don't know what large scale quite means, but I think most, most firms involved in direct marketing or any sort of data work will be caught up by this, uh, by this ask. And data protection office is going to be funny because they're going to be independent and they will report directly to the board. And they also can't have a conflict of interest. So you couldn't have a, uh, a CMO as his, as his CMO function, but also as a data protection officer because he's got conflicting, conflicting interests there. So they're essentially a whistleblower in an organisation to uh, blow that whistle if they see anything untoward or they think is a, a risk to privacy. Um, now, the big if people in your organisation, senior levels, aren't paying attention and not thinking about this, this is the best way to get their attention. The uh, fines in the regulation are eye-watering, so at the highest level you can be fined 20 million euros or 4% of global turnover. The uh, EU Commission definitely had the likes of Facebook and Google in their minds when they dreamt up these uh, eye-watering fines. But yeah, as I say, it does, there are various other mitigating factors, so it's not as if for a minor breach or certain minor infringements, you're going to suddenly have a phone call and be whacked with a 4% a fine on global turnover. And the regulators will still, the Information Commissioner's Office in the UK, will still have a liberal interpretation of the law. To help get your organisation ready, this is just some good, useful materials online. The Information Commissioner's Office have this 12-step uh, guide, really, really short, you know, two, three sentences for each one that basic questions that you should be thinking about as a marketer and they will put you in good stead moving forward. We've also got a function on the DMA website. We have a GDPR section on the left hand side if you go onto our site. There's a little drop down box and we host webinars up there, lots of good content 
events that we're doing and various other things. So do go check it out if you've got any questions. Now that's about all I wanted to cover for today, but if you have any more questions, data protection or on the regulation or anything really, then please do feel free to get in touch on my uh, email address up there. Any questions? Yes. And does it really matter? Um, courts are a bit reluctant to do anything. Courts are trying to reduce caseload. Mm. Um, I can give a, a precise example. The second March of this year, at Brighton, in a court protection case, mm. which is a gallons of case, and very, very important, where the judge went looking on the internet for information about parties in there. Mm. Include, and, and came up across a right to be forgotten instance. He said he does, it doesn't matter. There were strong legal arguments that followed. He had to resign from the case, mm. which I think is the first time it's happened in British legal history. But my point is, he would rather design, resign than deal with this matter. Well, it's different, isn't it? That seems to be what the courts are doing. At the moment, it's based on that European Court of Justice case, the Google Spain one, the judgment. But the right to erasure formalises it in the regulation. So the regulation isn't actually law yet. It becomes law on the 25th of May 2018. So the situation will change after that point, I, th I, would, have, I would think. So, so you believe the courts will have a change, a quantum sea change of attitude as to the caseloads and everything else once all of this comes in? Really? Well, I, I, I can't speak for the courts, but you'd think they'd pay more heed to it if it, was, if it, if it, if it became law. Any other questions? Any questions on that? One for me, or Jillian, you know. Um, clearly you've been lobbying Brussels and, and the various mm -hmm. parties to, to implement this as much as possible. In those debates, how much was talked about the ethics of the PPI versus actually you know, where they settled in terms of the, the regulation versus actually what was morally questionable versus actually you should regulate this. I think most of the debate was centred on the creepy line and what is morally right. So the way it kind of stacked up in the end, you had vast amounts of consumer lobbyists and privacy advocates on one side talking about that. But also us ourselves, because that's what the DMA want. We don't want to have a situation where marketing scares people or we step over that line. So it's in all of our interest really to sort of rein that in and have a regulation where the, the, it's not, the spirit of the law is about doing what's right by people, not about what's technically possible in terms of permissioning data so you can have a bigger pool. You should be doing what consumers actually want and more in line with their views. So I think in terms of the debates, that was, just, that was something that went through the centre of it the whole time. And still is. That is essentially the big debate, really. Do you think companies will then start offering incentives to encourage the affirmative action? Well, it's the thing, you can't, unduly, you can't unduly incentivise people, so you would be perhaps going too far if you, it depends what sort of incentive you were talking about, but financial incentive, things like that, would be going over the, over the top and wouldn't be allowed, because you can't unduly incentivise people. But it's the definition of what is unduly. Yeah, this is the thing, so we have the, the words on paper. But all of it relies on precedent, people doing things, how the courts interpret it, how the regulator interpret it. We have the bones, but we don't have the flesh on it yet. And we've still got a while to go in that respect as well. We haven't had any formal guidance on it yet, so it's still us theorising on what we think it will mean. It applies both from B2B, B2C and B2B. So the regulation is concerned with what, it, what, what is or what isn't personal data. So whether it's in a B2B context or B2C, it's the same. So if you had a my email address, Zach Thornton, at dma.org, that is personal data, and I'm entitled to the same protections as with my personal private email address. But you personally, rather than the DMA, has a right to your... The DMA has an, has an right yeah, to Yeah, so the, the DMA are the owners, so they could give my email address out to a firm and say, you know, mark it to this email address. But I agree. <laughs> it, does get, <laughs> it does get more complicated, yes. But the, the problem is, a lot of people in the B2B space don't even realise that this would apply to them at, at all. Yeah. We did some research, GDPR <coughs> research. The awareness in the B2C sector is, is quite high, and in B2B it's really not. They don't even apply the rules properly now, let alone the ones that are coming in. Yeah, so a question for me. So I can ask for my, about my data for free from companies now. 
Mm -hmm. So if I was to say to my bank, you have been a customer for 25 years, what data do you have about me? Mm. Do they have to share all the statements, all the credit history, scoring? Do they share that data or do they just say, we've got these... The bank, the, the bank will have to share that data with you in the future. Right. And there'll be guidance at some point. They'll have to provide it to you in a format that's useful to you as well, which is right. a big departure in the past. So it really is putting the power in your hands, which is a problem for businesses because it's yeah. often it's that their asset is that data. So it does undermine that somewhat. Yeah. 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 Will these new rules uh, affect all businesses or is there like a lower threshold of small business with small number of clients? There isn't a distinction between you see, saying the sort of an, an SME exemption for the rules. Right. There isn't anything in the, like that in there, no. So, so it does apply. Small businesses really need to be aware of this. Well, this is the thing. The, the um, yeah. um, I can't remember her name. She's the head of the uh, French Data Protection Authority. And obviously, when they're drafting up these rules, they don't have the baker who collects a bit of data about his customers in mind when they're talking about it. So. The regulation's there, but it's only useful in so much as it's enforceable and enforced by the regulators. And the regulators aren't going to be pursuing those small businesses whatsoever. So <coughs> you're not going to have a situation where your baker's got a data, a data protection officer. <laughs> yeah. uh, what sort of impact does a uh, proposed legislation like the Snoopers Charter and that sort of thing have on the data, data protection? I'm not too sure that the Snoopers Charter does affects this too much, really. I'm not really familiar with the Snoopers Charter. Uh, okay, it's just like the access to data. I'm just thinking only talking about like uh, erasure of your information held by different companies mm. and whatnot, and obviously from like a, a law enforcement or national security sort of perspective. Would you be allowed to do that? It's interesting because a lot of what's in, I can't speak for the Snoopers Charter, I'm not too familiar, but in the context of uh, America, a lot of what's in here is in contradiction as to what happens in America. So we have a big problem at the moment with uh, transatlantic data flows with uh, European and companies sending their personal data to America, perhaps for HR purposes, but not necessarily, maybe on the cloud. And then the US authorities hoover it up and it gets taken away in mass surveillance. So that's been a huge problem. And essentially the US companies operating the EU and the US are in essence more frightened of the US authorities than they are of the EU to so choose to disobey our law in instead. At the moment, the EU US Privacy Shield that's uh, been announced was looking hopeful, but the US government hasn't offered any concrete remedies over here. For this. So if your data is abused or hoovered up in one of these mass surveillance missions, you don't really have any legal recourse whatsoever. So, and that is the fundamental problem. And the EU US Privacy Shield for all its guff and bluster, doesn't seem to actually solve that imbalance. So um, the European Data Protection Authorities were looking at it recently and their view that it was its lightweight and it's not up to scratch. So if they did choose to release it, I would suspect it would be challenged in the courts, say like Safe Harbour was, and probably struck down for the same reasons. But I can't see a situation where the US authorities move substantially from where they are at the moment. So. Okay, thanks very much. Thanks. Thank you. So, uh, thanks very much to Hugh and Zach for presentations uh, tonight, and thanks to everybody joining online as well. Um, the next meetup, I think, is on the 28th of July. That will be over in Glasgow in the Tontine building. Um, if you didn't make the last one, it was uh, a full capacity, and it's quite an amazing building, I'm told. So, it's well worth uh, a trip through to see that. Um, and if you want to stay for some more beers or some more drinks downstairs, please finish them, or else we'll be doing that tomorrow afternoon. So uh, <laughs> thanks very much for coming along, and uh, have a good evening. Thank you. <laughs>